Uh, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And uh, in that spirit, I want to use a paired comparison of forest protection efforts in the United States with those in Ecuador. Um, so this is largely going to be a story about the environmental movement. And uh, in that sense, I guess it, it's something of a departure from the previous uh, papers. OK, um, very briefly, this is just uh, data from the World Conservation Monitoring Center on total numbers and areas protected uh, worldwide. I actually think this is an underestimate of the rates of increase, largely because lots of local forms of protection aren't counted. But as you can see, um, there's a rather robust increase in the numbers of, and, and um, amount, amount extent of protected areas uh, in the world, and it seems to be continuing. Okay, now, actually, if you look at e explanations and what the literature says about who's, what's driving the recent uh, efforts to protect forests, there's um, actually not, th there's two basic explanations. Um, one is that it's elite uh, agents of conservation, either wealth, it, if you're, depending on how far back you're going, historically, it could be wealthy people uh, donating land. Uh, E. A. Harriman in uh, the Bear Mountain Harriman uh, State Park, right outside New York City, is a good example. Uh, more recently, it's wealthy foundations buying conservation easements. That's one argument. Uh, there's another argument which focuses more on conservation coalitions that counter development threats by you know with expanded by by expanding protected areas. Okay, and there's problems with both of these explanations. Um, the elite-based explanation doesn't really acknowledge the role of threats to the environment. I mean, it means it, it, they, they remain vaguely kind of, uh, they're vague in a lot of these sorts of explanations. And it also sort of ignores more or less the rise of the environmental movement over the last 20 to 25 years. The uh, conservation coalition argument is largely, at least, at least the, 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 the most recent articles that I've seen are, are mostly statistical. In other words, they're global aggregate kinds of analyses that um, in some senses, because they don't get down to the ground, lack a certain, uh, just aren't that convincing. So without, without these problems in mind, I have this paired comparison that I'm going to walk you through right now. Okay, uh, the method here is, oh my god, these places are so different. Um, is there any kind of common elements that run through these two, these two, these cases that we're going to be talking about? And this is the Mills method of agreement, if you want to get formal about it. It's also what uh, Charles Hill used to call universalizing comparisons. So basically, as you hear the stories of these two sorts of conservation uh, efforts, try to sort of uh, focus on what's common in the two stories. So this is the first case. Uh, it's Morona Santiago in Ecuador. Uh, the vertical dimension in social life here is uh, salient. This is a shot taken at about 1,000 meters looking up at about 5,300 meters. So it's right on the eastern slope of the Andes. Uh, you've got two ethnicities here, um, Shuar, and they, they reside in the, in the lowland portions, primarily below 1,200 meters. And uh, the Shuar are, I, I'll say more about them uh, uh, as we go along, but they're, uh, suffice it to say that right now they're a very organized and reasonably uh, aggressive uh, Amerindian group. And the other group are mestizo smallholders who actually invaded this region and taken, it, at least in, in, in the initial period, a lot of land away from the Shuar. Since about 1970, actually the Shuar have done quite well in terms of retaining and expanding their land holdings. This is just a Schwar household uh, or, or house on a road. This is a, a colonist couple. The man on the right, on the left, is 88. He's, uh, he came down to mine gold in this area um, in the, around 1940, and uh, then got chased up the hill by the Schwar and a, a, a fight between Peru and Ecuador, up the hill, meaning back into the Sierra, and um, then came returned to the region in the 1960s and 70s and started a small cattle ranch. So that, that, and it was this dynamic that actually dispossessed the Schwar of a fair amount of line, land up until about 1970. So right now you've got these two ethnicities and the land in the area is more or less divided between the two. The land on the left is held by, uh, by colonists, the land on the right is held by uh, Schwar, but there's a the other thing to note is that the, uh, that the eastern wall of the Andes begins about here, um, right about here, and nobody is, virtually nobody lives up in that, in that region. 
Okay, cow, small scale cattle ranching is the, probably the most common livelihood in the region. The Schwar do this almost as much as the colonists. The other, uh, the other way in which people make a living is, and this is more Schwar than colonists, is by commercial cash cropping of basic garden crops for sale in, in the growing urban areas in the region. This is the provincial capital, and uh, the, the, a destination for a lot of those garden, uh, truck garden uh, crops. This area across here is a foot, is a foothills of the of the Andes. It's called the uh, Kutuku uh, Protected Forest Region, and and um, again, there's virtually nobody who lives in this area. Okay, the other significant economic activity is is gold mining and silver mining. This area has contains a, 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 a lot of uh, rich mineral oils, and, uh, mineral ores, and um, in this particular instance, the uh, there was a landslide in 1983 that unveiled some old Incan and Spanish mine works and led to a gold rush up in this valley. Another landslide in 1993 killed uh, about 300 miners. After which, the, all of the claims in this area were sold to a Canadian mining company, and. In addition, there are silver mining companies that want to open up exploitation in these regions. Okay, so what, what do we have in the way of preservation here? A rather rapid expansion of, of, for, of protected areas. This area is the Sangai National Park. It was first formed in 1975 when a group of conservationists brought in by the central government flew over the region and said this ought to be conserved. They could see a lot of colonists' uh, land clearings down here in the, in the lowlands. And so they, they, they said, establish a park, and the government went ahead and did that. Um, there were some shenanigans around the boundaries. They hired some of the colonists to draw the boundaries, who proceeded to draw the boundaries with all the good arable land outside the park. They got fired. Um, after, after the park was created, uh, some Schwar living in the lowlands discovered that the hunting was better in the park. They moved into the park, then got evicted. Um, in, 1992, in 1992, shortly after Ecuador was uh, uh, informed that they had the highest deforestation rates in the in the, in, Latin, in South America, um, the government felt compelled to do something. And what they did is they expanded this protected area uh, to the south. This is an area where virtually nobody lives, so it was a cost-free politically move by the central government. At the same time, it was a center-left government that did this. They also um, basically. Uh, acknowledged and legitimized some long-standing claims by the Schwar to establish a protected forest over in that ridge that you just, that, that cordillera that I just showed you. And here there were some efforts by mining companies, silver mining companies, to open up exploitation. The Schwar saw a protected area here as a bulwark against the entrance of the multinationals. And so they were in favor of this and they got what they wanted, in part because they, because they had a sympathetic uh, political administration. Then there was a war in uh, that developed, the bo continuing border conflict went through another episode in the, in the uh, early in the 80s and then again early in the 90s and the Schwar came up with the idea of establishing a binational park here, which the uh, Ecuadorian government immediately interpreted as an attempt by the Schwar to establish an independent state. So that they, were, they didn't receive it too well. Um, and, uh, but, but through some, cons again, uh, concerted lobbying on the part of the Schwar, a change in administrations, and the entrance of three uh, well-known NGOs, or the Schwar managed to establish that the biodiversity in this area merited some sort of protection. And the, the NGOs were uh, Moore, CI, and MacArthur. And, but inter interestingly enough, they only did planning uh, st studies here. The Schwar wouldn't let them use any kind of conservation easements or try anything of that sort. So, and then, then across the border, uh, it was about a 20-year effort that culminated in the formation on the Peruvian side here of another national park just last year. So now we have this conservation corridor that is running up and down this area, and there are attempts to, to say, see if we can link them in some sort of way. So what's going on here? Well, there's kind of evidence for both of those kind of the paths to protected areas that we talked about. Certainly the early uh, Sangai examples are um, uh, evidence of this elite agent kind of model. But the latter, uh, latter efforts in, uh, involving the Schwar, the NGOs, and, and sympathetic government officials really are closer to this conservation corridor idea. Okay, so that's one case. The second case is in the suburbs of New Jersey, and a place like where 
So with uh, allowances for hyperbole, we're talking about the front range of the Appalachians. Pretty near uh, major metropolitan areas. And this is the region we're going to be talking about in New Jersey. Now this is a shot looking eastward towards Manhattan, towards Manhattan from about 35 miles out. And I threw that kind of question in there, but um, is any, I don't know if any of you are familiar with New Jersey. Does something strike you as wrong about this? No, no, I was just saying. Uh -huh. Well, what's wrong about it is there are no houses. Where's the throughway? Where are the roads? Where's the turnpike? There's no houses, there's no roads, there's no people. Well, what this is is all preserved open space. And it suggests something about the scale of the preservation efforts in this place. This is, a, this is actually an example of, of, of a place which preserved relatively little land. And you can see how it was done over about a 40 to 45 year period in small, basically, increments. This place went from about 1% to 17% um, preserved during that 35 year period. This is a more typical case of more preservation. Uh, the, the subdivisions of single family homes are right here. This was already preserved land. And then these lands were preserved again in that same time period. Some of them are preserved farmland. Others are preserved forest. So if you, look, if you average across the 83 communities, you get a fairly significant, really a quite significant shift of land into protected status over a 35 year period. It went from about 7% up to a little bit below 30%. Um, and how do we know this? We spent a lot of time uh, looking at community tax records in the 83 communities. OK, so what's driving this force? <laughs> what's the driving force here? Well, this is one good, uh, w w one hypothesis anyway, a McMansion. And how does this work? Well, basically, these conflicts start out, things start out with a conflict between builders and community residents. The builders eventually get permission to build only by donating about half the land that they originally wanted to build as open space. And uh, proximity to the, ho the house to open space, of course, uh, rewards the builder by enabling him to, uh, to raise this, the selling price. If you're mayor of the town, you can claim that you formed seven parks or something like that during your tenure just because you, did, you saw seven development projects, each of which led to a park. So here's one story. Um, basically, uh, this, this particular tract um, was donated to the Boy Scouts in memory of, of their son who was a Boy Scout and then a, a Boy Scout official and then passed away. Uh, the Boy Scouts used this land for about almost 50 years, then sold it to AT&T, which tried to turn it into a, a management center with a helipad. The townspeople didn't like that. Um, AT&T got frustrated and sold the land to a developer. <coughs> The townspeople continued to fight, bringing in NGOs this time, including the Nature Conservancy. And um, the developer got tired of waiting and basically went, went bankrupt, sold it to another developer. The second, devel the second developer eventually arrived at um, a uh, some sort of agreement and approval in 1996 and began to build his homes in 1998. So it, it took him about 20 years to get this development going. So what did they get? Well, he got this, this piece of land. And uh, the reserve was this, this area around it. Now notice what he did here. Um, he basically maximized the, the edge area of his houses around the park at the cost of fragmenting the, uh, the, the protected area. That probably increased the sale price. The other thing to note here is that there's momentum. Um, here's the, th these, th this reserve now exists. These, these are areas that, are, that this reserve is now trying to purchase. So these, these sorts of things have a history and a legacy that actually can uh, grow over time. Okay, so what sorts of conclusions can we draw from all of this? Um, it seems as though that it really, if you're going to talk about conservation of protected areas, you have to talk about the threats because it's the threats that mobilize people, that mobilize people in the movement. It, it just, to talk about conservationists without talking about the context within which they see themselves working, without the threats in particular that they see, seems to me to be ahistorical. Um, and the other second thing to note is of these two sorts of explanations, it's clear to me that the conservation coalitions are the, 
uh, th th you can still see examples of these elite agents operating, but conservation coalitions are clearly sort of the coming thing. But how the internal dynamics of these coalitions vary a lot from place to place politically. So you would not expect, for instance, that the Schwar kind of call it, are, are essentially able to dictate to these wealthy NGOs the terms of their involvement in that Ecuadorian case, but they were able to do it. Okay, questions. Well, I mean, first of all, this is based on two cases. The one case, the, the Ecuadorian case, doesn't have any inholders. I mean, clearly, that's, that's out of the ordinary, especially given the cases that we've talked about here. Um, so you can certainly ask reasonable questions about the generality of, of this argument. The, um, the, other, the other second kind of conclusion is, that, okay, if there really is this development conservation link, and it does seem to me that there is, at least in the cases that, that, that I can see, then one might expect that actually if development slows down, conservation might slow down too. And if you want to explain why we keep getting more and more protected areas despite critiques of, of protected areas and their social exclusionary status or effects, it's because we've got more and more development going on. And this actually just echoes something that Mahesh and, and, and in a way Jeff were, were alluding to earlier. The, the, the final point I guess I want to make and, and conclude on is that all of this dynamic where you get essentially conservation occurring in an episodic sort of way, there's a, a, a development threat followed by a mobilization to conserve an area, it sort of presumes that the state is neutral or at least fairly passive. The state can, can be brought in as a member of a conservation coalition or as the member of a growth coalition with the mining companies. Um, but they aren't mobilized until the companies actually try to do something and then the conservation is sort of mobilized. Uh, counter mobilized. This strikes me as the kind of dynamic that you would expect in a neoliberal kind of context. And so one would might expect if, for instance, we get something like red, reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation, as part of a climate change uh, agreement, we might expect to see conservation take a quite different form in that changed political context. Questions? Robin? In the New Jersey scenario, what is the role of land trusts in this whole conservation effort? Yeah, they're, they're part of the NGOs. The, uh, in other words, what happened in this instance, the, um, that shift one case, the a, a land trust begin, uh, agreed to become the arbiter uh, to hold the land. Um, and actually, the developers never actually bought the land. They negotiated with the land trust after AT&T AT AT sold the land to a land trust. The developers then entered into an agreement with the land trust. The land trust, uh, it's, it's actually hard to distinguish them from a landowner because in many instances, they ended up allowing you know, uh, 180 acres of developed land in this instance. They did get 350 odd acres of land that went into a, a, a formal land trust, meaning one where there were conservation easements so the land could not be developed. But in other ways, they were a broker, much like a realtor. So it's a kind of ambiguous, uh, ambiguous role sometimes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I thought you were standing up for a question. Yeah. Jim. How confident are you that land trusts can hold on to preservation over generations? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, Conservation, most, I mean, the tool they usually use are, is conservation easements, which is to say they buy the development rights to the land. And um, in the U.S. legal framework, I'm pretty confident that that's, that's the kind of thing that would hold up but, uh, because they're paying market rights for these development rights. But the use of conservation easements outside the U.S. or in other kinds of other settings, which the CI, for instance, talks a lot about doing that, that strikes me as a much more problematic sort of thing, and I don't know, in fact, how, whether or not they would, they'll work over. I don't have much sense about how, they, how well they would work. Just a little about the conservation coalitions, because you talked about the Shoah wanting the protected area, but is there possibility of other kinds of protected areas, you know, conservation areas like in Tibet or Nepal, or are these coalitions very specific only to stopping that mining? or do they have a longer term? Well, well, certainly certainly in the case of the Shuar, the impetus behind the, co the, the creation of those protected areas was it was a device to, to, to stop the mining companies. Because the mining companies, they're foreign. They, they, the Shuar saw them as a way of basically maintaining uh, uh, the land in a form that they found friendly and usable and keeping these foreigners out. OK, yeah. 
a related question and turning your methodology the other way around. You were looking at the similarities in two very different right. cases. Um, then looking at the differences, you talked about the role of the land trusts, uh, where in the U.S. case, at any rate, they're seen in, to some extent as the honest broker that brokers, brokers the agreement. Uh, looking then to the case in Ecuador and following up last question, uh, similar cases I know of where the Nature Conservancy has tried to play this role in China. How does that work? Because you have some very, very difficult situations there of a totally outside agency coming in to present themselves as the honest broker, but in practice really trying to forward an agenda that is very different from the agenda of the Schwa mm -hmm. or the local people. Mm -hmm. So the outside, very far outside, honest mm -hmm. broker mm -hmm. plays a very different role yeah. in this situation. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I think there, there's two elements to the question, and they're both very good, uh, you know, very pertinent questions. One is, I think the discourse surrounding these guys, it, it's a discourse. And so the whole idea that they're honest brokers strikes me as, I, th I think on close inspection, it, 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 it begins to break down in the U.S., and I think it, there's similar kinds of problems up with it applied in a developing country context. So. I mean, I, I think that you're right there. The other thing to say is I should have said something about the differences between these two settings. I mean, one is that the incomes in the, in the New Jersey setting are about 25 times the incomes of, in the Ecuadorian case. And there are social equity issues here, which oddly enough, and this just is particular to the case, I think are not, in, in part because the Schwar are not interested in working at higher elevations. Um, if anything, they're urbanizing along the lines that Christine was talking about earlier today. Um, I don't see social equity implications in Ecuador. Um, I, I mean, they're, they're trying to keep the mining companies out. Um, in, in the case of New Jersey, what you've got is middle class sprawl going to upper class sprawl. And the idea, what it, that's doing is forcing middle class people to look for housing in the, in the inner cities, like Jersey City and Newark and places like that, which has implications for low income housing in New Jersey. So there, there's some equity implications that are kind of nasty. So there's all kinds of differences here. I just wanted to make the initial point that there's some uh, there's some similarities, at least in the way that the the environmental movement operates. Okay, one more question, James. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I th I think that um, it might be important to expand the breadth of your cases in a way because by focusing on these two, you can um, I think miss out on the way in which uh, transnational mining corporations get into bed with conservation organizations outside of the uh, rights and uh, roles of, of, of yeah. the people. So, uh, and secondly, you can get out of the way in which those inhabitants of those great mansions are buying up tracts of the Amazon in certain ways. So I, th I, think, I think we can complexify this. Um, away from the examples, you need many more, I think. To well, that's true, except that it's hard to do field research in many more places. Um, I, I would also say that, um, I mean, I think you're right. The two cases are not completely independent of one another. You've got the Nature Conservancy operating in both places. This is what's called an incorporated comparison. You've got two cases in a world system, and they're not entirely separate, so I think your point's really well taken. It's just that the practicalities of actually carrying out field research in a couple more than two settings gets kind of daunting. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>